In the spirit of uh, Xi Jinping, uh, I prepared some opening remarks that will last about three and a half hours. Uh, not this, that was a joke. Um, I'm actually uh, a bit surprised to be sitting here because, as Rebecca uh, mentioned, uh, much of my career was focused on the Middle East and uh, had uh, very little knowledge of China or really very little interest in China. Uh, and then about a decade ago, um, uh, very kind of randomly got a job offer uh, in Asia uh, with Dow Jones to cover economics and finance. Uh, and as I soon learned, uh, in Asia, when you cover economics and finance, you essentially cover China. Uh, every piece of economic data out of China uh, moves markets and has, has uh, repercussions around Asia that you can't even anticipate. Uh, a, a small data point about uh, Chinese demand for commodities uh, may, you know, may end up uh, moving markets in Australia and uh, uh, be reflected in uh, uh, Australian unemployment figures. So um, you start to realize that there's all, all kinds of connections around Asia that are, that are focused on China. Um, it's not just the economics, there's also uh, a soft power aspect to it. Uh, increasingly you see Chinese tourists all over Asia and the infrastructure is being created now to service them. You see services like WeChat uh, that are used uh, all over Asia, which are, uh, uh, you know, it, it, it's kind of the Chinese equivalent of WhatsApp. Um, you also see uh, hard power politics. Um, I spent a lot of time in the Philippines on the island of Palawan, and just offshore there, uh, China is uh, expanding its presence in the South China Sea, uh, at, at, which is a subject of great concern to the Philippines and its neighbors. So uh, China is really uh, omnipresent, uh, no matter what you're covering around Asia. Uh, and my last job before I moved here at Bloomberg was covering uh, airlines, trains, and shipping. Uh, so I had really kind of a uh, close-up view of China's efforts to build uh, national champions that can compete internationally and to use uh, uh, infrastructure diplomacy, really. Um, infrastructure as a means of, of, of cementing its, its power uh, around the world. So it was a fascinating time to be a China watcher. Uh, and even more so um, a couple months ago as this 19th uh, Communist Party Congress approached, uh, which you know, may seem kind of an obscure event uh, to people here, but it was actually one of the more momentous political events in China in, in recent decades. Uh, President Xi Jinping laid out a very ambitious agenda, not just for five years, as Congresses normally do, uh, but for 30 years. Uh, talked about China's place on the world stage uh, and, and, and how that will be changing. Uh, so today what we're going to be discussing is what was this vision that, uh, that uh, the Central Committee laid out for the next 30 years? Uh, what does it mean that Xi Jinping was, was elevated in his status, uh, that uh, Xi, Xi Jinping thought was uh, put into the Communist Party uh, doctrine, uh, placing Xi almost on a level with uh, Mao? Uh, and what does it mean that China will be uh, asserting its influence on the global stage? What are the implications for the world and specifically for Israel? To answer these questions, we have a, a great panel that uh, um, can shed more insight on these. We have uh, Wang Shan joining us by, by Skype. Uh, he's the deputy managing editor and an editorial board member of uh, uh, Caixin Media. Uh, he oversees their foreign desk and their branding efforts. Uh, before that, he served as the international editor of uh, Caixin Magazine. Um, he was based for a while in the US, based for a while in Hong Kong as well. We have um, Roe Fetter, the Managing Director of AFCO Worldwide in Israel, uh, leading the services to governments, healthcare, technology, uh, and other practices in Israel, working with uh, major Chinese corporations and uh, advising as well on the geostrategic uh, aspects of, of uh, Chinese power. And we have Alexander Pevsner, the Founding Director of the Chinese Media Center, as Rebecca mentioned, and uh, a former colleague of mine at Dow Jones in Asia. Um, so thank you all for being here. Uh, it's great to have such a, uh, such a good audience. And thank you, Rebecca, for putting on this event. Um, Alexander, let me start with you. Uh, what was so significant about this 19th Party Congress? What was the vision that she laid out? And you know, what are the implications for, for Israel and the world? Thank you, Michael. So I attended the opening speech of Xi Jinping uh, in Beijing. It was three and a half hours. And I'll summarize it in five, six minutes. Okay. Uh, I think the best way to summarize it is uh, how Xinhua put it in November. There was an article, a long article about Xi Jinping, a profile of Xi Jinping in Xinhua, saying at this point, she is the unri unrivaled helmsman who will steer China toward this great dream. Okay? And I think that really uh, does the job. What does it mean, the heir of, uh, of Xi Jinping? 
first of all, we have to understand what this Congress is. Uh, the national congresses of the party usually take place uh, once in five years. Uh, Xi Jinping has been in power since 2012, when he was uh, appointed the general secretary of the Central Committee of the party. But he inherited a standing committee and a central committee uh, with people who sort of remained there from previous uh, administrations. So the era of Xi Jinping is also, what is dubbed by analysts, the era of Xi Jinping is also uh, me being Xi Jinping appointing, making sure that all the party is completely behind him and focused on his uh, vision. Uh, the mere fact that the speech was three and a half hours is a message in and of itself, okay, which is uh, five years ago, uh, a previous speech by Hu Jintao, the exiting uh, party secretary, was less than half uh, long. And I think Xi Jinping has been actually uh, talking about these main points of his vision since 2012, but in the Congress, he got the official imprimatur of the party uh, behind it. And as uh, you know, Xi Jinping has said when he introduced his new standing committee at the end of the Congress, October 24th, he said um, uh, the Chinese Communist Party is the biggest uh, party in the world. That means it has to act big, not just be big, but also uh, act big. Now, the two things that Xi Jinping uh, sort of uh, talked about to summarize is uh, the two centennial goals. Okay? The first centennial goal is 100 years since the founding of the uh, Communist Party of China. It was founded in 1921, so we're talking about uh, four or five years down the road in 2021. Is uh, to achieve a moderately prosperous society, okay, what is called in Chinese Xiao Kang Shui. Now, this is not a mere slogan because you have to understand the path, the progress that China made in the past 30, 35 years since the start of 34. Okay? We're talking about a, a huge country, over a billion people population, uh, relatively <coughs> poor country. Even now, China's GDP is the average GDP per capita is about 55% of the world's average. Okay, so you have to understand that China is still a developing country. So when Chinese leaders, not just Xi Jinping in general, talk about achieving moderately prosperous society, this is something that every Chinese can understand. It means raising the living standards. And Xi Jinping, almost in every speech, he talks about eradicating extreme poverty. Okay, this is something that is extremely important for China. And you know, if the economy will continue to grow by the pace that it's growing recently, by 2021, they will probably achieve that. Okay? The next centennial goal is uh, 100 years since the founding of the, uh, the People's Republic of China. So that will be in 2049. And that's a making China a completely modern and a strong, strong country, but more so to be a model for the world, to be a country that the world would like to learn from, okay, in terms of economic development, in terms of societal development. So, I think we have to appreciate the really impressive confidence of the leadership. Okay? I mean, here in Israel, we uh, live by uh, five-minute de uh, deadlines. Here, the party is going beyond the, the usual five-year plan. Okay? He is sort of mapping out the road for the next 30 years. So this is uh, uh, very impressive. Now, China has problems, of course. One is uh, the difference between the gap between the rich and the poor, what's called the Gini coefficient, is extremely high in China. And I think we, we have to delve a little bit into the ideology of the party. This is, may sound very uh, uh, ideological or arcane, but he got his thought written into the party constitution. It's called Chinese, uh, Xi Jinping thought for Chinese uh, uh, Social and Chinese characteristics for the new era. What does this new new era mean? Since 1982, since uh, Deng Xiaoping, uh, the previous one of the previous leaders, uh, put this uh, slogan, uh, "Social and Chinese characteristics," into the uh, into sort of the official agenda of, of the party, uh, the Communist Party, being a Marxist party, 
uh, they talk about you know, dialectical Marxism, they talk about contradiction. So the main contradiction was between the uh, needs and insufficient production. Okay? So you know, people want to eat, people want to buy clothes, and there's not enough to go around with China being a poor, you know, basically rural-based uh, country. Fast forward 30 years, you know, China is the world's second largest economy. It's very impressive, but you know, there's still uh, work to do. So in his speech, and this is the big chidush, the big innovation of Xi Jinping, and I think contrary to what experts uh, uh, think, I, I think that it, there is something new there. Uh, he changed the definition of contradictions. Okay? This is now it's contradiction between uh, uh, the, the production or the, the needs of the people and unbalanced development. So basically they're acknowledging that, okay, China economy is growing, China is growing, China is becoming more important, but there are things the society needs which needs to be developed further. Okay, we all know that uh, pollution, okay, rural development, things, things like this. That I think this is uh, what sort of the main uh, things that come out of the Congress, which also shows that the bottom line politically for the party is to continue focusing on development. Thanks, <coughs> um, Wang Shan. I guess you. Uh, Heard that response. One of the things that that uh, struck me uh, in the presentation uh, at, at at the party congress was this uh, idea that, despite all of its successes and the um, increasing strength that uh, China is projecting, uh, that it still has "quote unquote" severe challenges uh, that it has to to address in the coming years. Um, maybe you can talk to us a bit about you know what are some of those challenges and what is what has she been doing and what does he plan to do to to address them. Well, thank you, uh, thank you all, thank you, uh, Israel China Center, thank you, Michael, thank you, Rebecca, and thank you, uh, um, um, Alex, for, for inviting me here, and I uh, join humble views with all these distinguished guests and uh, our audience. So, first of all, I will emphasize that um, if President Xi's first term featured anti corruption campaign and the military modernization, his second term will feature at least three uh, major tasks. Number one is that the continuing, continuing uh, supply side structural reform, uh, which featuring three Ds the capacity, the, the leveraging, and the de stacking. And also, number two is about uh, poverty alleviation. It's really, really ambitious, but uh, simply it's a multiple goal because by 2020, it aims to lived around 43 million poor people out of poverty. It's really, really a, uh, you know, ambitious goal. Number three is about uh, environmental protection. Everybody knows that uh, the air quality and the soil and the groundwater contamination is big top, you know, um, endanger uh, people's daily life and also, uh, uh, um, you know, damage the uh, the party and the government's image in the uh, uh, you know handling the economy and handling runway economic growth. So I think at least we have three top um, policy goals and uh, policy priorities in President's second term. And I will draw on also your attention to the, you know how President Xi and his new government to deal with these the huge challenges. The first one, I think, um, President Xi will uh, more rely more on the party operators, I mean the CCP, all the uh, party affiliates like the organization department, like the uh, CCBI, the anti-corruption watchdog, and also the uh, the party, uh, for example, the United Front, Work Front, uh, Front uh, Department, to push ahead is the uh, policy goals. I will just give you two examples. The first one is that uh, uh, just in the, uh, uh, according to recent media reports, joint inspection team from the Ministry of Environmental Protection and the anti-corruption uh, watchdog and the CCP's organization department all have already punished 18,000 polluting companies with fine fines of 132 million US dollars and this supreme around 12,000 officials. Another example was that past year, last year, the Hebei province, you know, just the next door Beijing, the 
it's a print uh, authorities, local discipline authorities, have to account around 2,000 local officials for violations, including failure to cut uh, industry capacity, over capacity, for example, the steel and the uh, aluminum and the, and the coal production uh, volumes. So it's increasingly, you know, the property you will be taken at once. <coughs> so I think it's really new phenomenon that we will see the party play a more prominent role in Chinese economic life in the years to come. And number two, uh, I will emphasize that uh, um, uh, everybody knows that uh, we talk about a uh, new image, a new arrow. So I think the new arrow means that uh, um, we not just about the runaway economic growth, like a double digit economic growth, but also the high quality. I think quality growth, rather than the quantity growth, now is really uh, uh, the, the point of <coughs> hit. And let me uh, elaborate on, more on this. Um, for example, people say uh, 2020, um, Chinese nation needs to, the party needs to really, um, achieve is the du two doubles, uh, two doubles growth. That means the double per capita GDP, the double the, uh, the general gross GDP by 2020. That means China must maintain the floor growth rate around 6.3%. So it's really interesting to see that uh, on the one hand, the party and the government don't want to, uh, really wants, you know, quality growth. But on the other hand, it really need to maintain a solid and a full growth rate. So um, it's really need a very um, sophisticated and a delicate action to make this, you know, seemingly um, contradictory goals achieved. But um, um, according to this year's per, uh, economic performance, I think it really give the, the presidency and his government more and increasing confidence in achieving this goal. Because if you look at this year's the, uh, uh, the GDP growth rate, I will not be surprised that by next two sessions, I mean the Hui, that means the NPC, National People's Congress, and the CPPPC, Chinese Political Consultory uh, uh, Meeting, uh, we will see that uh, uh, goals this year should be a 6.3 or 6.8 percent GDP. So uh, let's let's worry about the economic growth goal to be achieved. Another thing I want to draw our audience and house to attention to is that uh, um, we will see uh, a, quite a lot of behaviors and policies on part of government departure from the previous norms. And according to conventional wisdom. Three months before, uh, you know, between the part Congress and the next year, two sessions will be a relatively quiet period of time in political and economic terms. That means nobody will anticipate major policy announcement in this interim of a three or four months. But now, actually, if you really be a daily reader of Chinese, the page, you know, China pages of the Water Journal or Bloomberg News or New York Times, you will really notice that quite a lot of a number of your policies and bold initiatives is to mount during this interim. For example, the crackdown on the asset management products and also the uh, latest wave of the anti-graph campaign and also the uh, environmental protection measures. So, oh, uh, this really mark the, the departure on the part of the presidency and his government from the previous norms. And also talking about personnel arrangement, uh, I will be not surprised to see some new positions, new uh, personnel um, shuffle in the coming you know, two sessions. And uh, maybe we will see some you know, unusual arrangement uh, of a personnel, particularly senior ranking personnel. In the in the coming months, so I will stop here and, and uh, allow our the other guests to to chip the words. Yeah. Uh, thank you, Wang. It, it, uh, it's interesting to hear about the anti-corruption crackdown there, and meanwhile here we have anti-corruption marches on uh, on Rostov Boulevard. Um, 
Rui, let me turn to you. Um, Xi Jinping also outlined this vision of China, uh, you know, in addition to its economic might, um, exercising its political might on the world stage, taking its place uh, as a great power in coming decades. Um, what would a, and, and, and especially as, as, you know, there's a perception that America is, is kind of stepping back a bit uh, from that role. So what would a Chinese-led world order look like uh, what would the implications be for the West and for, for Israel? Um, you know, when, he, when, when Xi Jinping uh, gave his speech, his three and a half hour uh, speech on uh, October 18th, um, you know, if you're, if you're in the States looking at the news, you would see you know, his speech at the, um, uh, in, in Beijing and President Trump's speech in and, and the Rose Garden, and you know, one world leader uh, was having 20 minutes of attention span talking to journalists and to uh, people who he was uh, speaking to. And the other had three and a half hours of people sitting there paying attention to every word and analyzing everything that he said. I think that may have been a moment of, of change, uh, that, that moment that, that said to the world, um, there's a shift. Um, and I think that you know, you'll see a lot of analysts talking about this, this shift in, in power, this shift in, um, uh, in dominance. Um, it probably started um, also in Davos of last year. Uh, when President Xi started talking about you know, free trade, global trade, um, obviously having a much more relevant position when it came to the Paris uh, Climate Accords uh, for reasons which uh, uh, Shan just uh, mentioned. Uh, and now, um, the, 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 the relevance of China in, in global discourse um, is all of a sudden seen filling this void that didn't necessarily start off with the current president, probably started off with the former president, and, um, and, and that void is being, is being filled. It's being filled in, in different locations. You mentioned Southeast Asia, um, clearly in Central Asia with the Belt and Road Initiative um, uh, as a sort of a start off with a backdrop to the TPP, which didn't take shape, but the US focus on having some kind of alignment with uh, Pacific markets um, is one of the arguments for China taking this bold initiative to um, increase its sphere of influence going, uh, going to the West. Um, and our region, I think, is also very interesting to, uh, to China in that respect. Um, I think you, um, you, you are seeing also um, a decline. You know, if you look at you know, what's happening with Western democracies today uh, and the, um, the, the, the impact of a populist sentiment, the impact of social media, of digital uh, discourse, uh, that is something that is of concern to democratic societies, democratic uh, the, the ability of, of, of countries such as you know, the U.S., um, U.K., talking about Brexit, talking about uh, the election of President Trump, um, and the influence of other uh, countries into their political um, uh, issues. Um, you know, in China, that's very much um, uh, looked at and seen as you know weakness. You know, do we want to have the same model? So putting aside issues of party and communism and things that from a Western perspective you'd see as something very um, uh, sensitive, uh, there's a sense that maybe the model in the West is not working. We should make sure that whatever we do, we're able to solve those issues, which are very significant issues for our livelihood. I think that um, in our region, in the Middle East, there's also changes, uh, irrespective of China. And in many respects, what you're seeing is an, uh, a beginning of an alignment in this region with what is happening from China. And certainly, if you're looking at the major investments, the funds that are being set up, whether it's AIIB or ADB or uh, the Silk Road Fund, um, you're seeing an alignment of other Western financial institutions trying to help to fund some of the projects which China is leading. Uh, you're seeing member states uh, joining AIIB, Israel being one of them, completely disregarding what the U.S. is saying in that regard. Um, you're seeing companies trying to understand what are the new standards uh, which uh, Chinese technology will put in place and they want to be part of that conversation because they realize that the new standards for anything will not just be coming from Washington or Brussels, but also from Beijing. Um, and so if you're going to be seeing much more of a, um, of a focus from countries around the world, hopefully in Israel as well, I don't think we're, we're doing a good enough job in actually understanding what's happening in China uh, to align with what's you know, on, on Chinese plate. Uh, on the, the Chinese agenda, because we will need to figure out what is their intention to align the business realities here, the geopolitical realities here, um, and, 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 the, and the focus of, um, of our relationships internationally, because China will have a major dominant role in the next few years. Mm -hmm. um, Wang, let me go back to you a bit. Uh, 
you know, we hear about Xi Jinping thought, which uh, to Western ears, uh, it's, it's a strange concept to think about having a political philosophy, you know, named after the president. Um, and yet this is going to be the dominant uh, philosophy now for the Chinese Communist Party, which, as I was reading, has something like 89 million members, uh, 10 times the population of Israel. Um, so what, what are the main tenets of Xi Jinping thought? I mean, what, what, what makes it so deep and significant? And as a Chinese citizen, how does that affect your, your daily life? Okay, yes. About the uh, impact of the uh, Xi Jinping thought on the daily life of the Chinese people. So my sense is that um, it's actually everywhere. You know that uh, actually if you look at the uh, go to the streets of uh, Beijing or any big city or rural areas, you will see um, his, his, the, the banner carrying his words, you know, actually are uh, displayed everywhere. And also if you go to, it's, it's really, you know, um, ironic things, you know, many, you know, uh, uh, premier top you know, shopping period. Uh, shopping districts. So, for example, in some, you know, Shanghai, you know, the one of the best premium, premium uh, shopping districts. There's a good and a, a lot of luxury um, building brands there. But also, you know, the brands uh, will go a long ways. The, the party propaganda slogans and the banners. It's really, you know, to feel a lot of. First time I try, uh, Westerners, they don't know where they are. Actually, you are, if you are in the Western world or you are in the uh, Communist China. So, I think <coughs> the mass, at each time we talk about the masses convey by the, the central, from the central authority, I think the message is always mixed. And just talking about the uh, latest, the announced, the, uh, a lot of the pro market. Market oriented liberalization, you know, economic and financial policies. I think a lot of market oriented persons and uh, particularly a lot of Western countries will welcome, you know, these the bold initiatives. For example, just on the day of President Trump left China, Chinese the, uh, uh, Ministry of Finance announced a big step in really lifting the cap on uh, a financial. Uh, uh, of uh, on the uh, foreign ownership of a fin of financial services group here in China, and also we have seen the government try to crack down on the uh, runaway asset management products, you know, uh, the services here in China. Quite a lot of encouraging, you know, market-oriented uh, messages. But also, when it comes to state of state of enterprise reform, now here we just uh, use a kind of dragon to describe the reform. We call it the mixed ownership reform. And I will not be surprised that by next year, we'll see a really um, sped up um, ownership reform here in China. And the Chinese government has announced uh, four or five uh, key sectors which really allow more access to foreign and private uh, uh, sectors, like uh, telecommunications, aviation, and even the military industries. So, I, I think if you really read these the, uh, news, you will feel positive and also, you know, really encouraged by the Chinese leadership's the bold pro-market announcement. But on the other hand, we have seen, you know, <coughs> mismatch between the actions. And the third president of the 18th Congress is around uh, four years ago. At that time, we said, according to the party document, it announced that uh, we, the party will allow the market forces to play a decisive role in allocation of the uh, resources. But um, four years later, you know, um, I, I think the Western firms and businessmen, they see increasingly disappointing you know, a mismatch between the world's actions. And what's, when it comes to, for example, the Dreamway joint venture of the automakers here in China, Still, we insist on the previous model, the formula 50, 50 you know, a uh, 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 share uh, between the uh, foreign partners and domestic partners. Even when it comes to the uh, uh, new new electric vehicles, we call the uh, uh, new energy vehicle. There's still 
putting the uh, 50 50 you know, share, share, uh, uh, share holding structure. And uh, a lot of Western firms really file complaint with the Chinese regulators. Say, they say 30 years ago, you are a fragile auto industry. We fully understand why you place this the street, you know, joint venture structure. But now you are the, the world's largest auto uh, auto market, and, and also your domestic automakers have you know a lot of strong on uh, um, you know positions when it comes to competition with their foreign foreign competitors. Well, if you look at the figure now, the forty percent of Chinese the, the domestic auto market are occupied by you know homegrown brands at the six. 60% of the market occupied by steel or foreign brands. Still, um, we put in place the old formula, old uh, driven structure. So I think this, this really created a lot of all the market production, you know, activities and uh, and uh, and uh, uh, anti-foreign um, attitude back in China. So I think. In a final analysis, I would argue that always you you will see some positive and some negative news when it comes to Chinese the uh, economic and the financial agenda. And uh, but uh, uh, I think the key point is that uh, it really need to be uh, you know make our meet our words and 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 and, and actions uh, match uh, better in, in in the years to come. Yeah. Um. Alex, when, when you and I were covering uh, Asia for, for Dow Jones, uh, there was a lot of talk about the opening of, of, of China uh, as a market economy. Um, the, you know, would, would uh, kind of a, a state-managed capitalism uh, work, could it work? And as, as Wang Chan uh, uh, has said, the, the results have been a bit mixed. Um, also, when you look at attitudes toward leadership, uh, you know, uh, you know here, here, in, here in Israel, for example, People struggle with the fact that the same guy has been in power for eight years. Uh, in, in China, we've just seen the leader uh, elevated to uh, to a cult-like status almost. So when you mentioned in your original answer that China increasingly sees itself as a model for the world, uh, a model that other countries could follow, how exactly would you define the model that they're presenting? And how relevant is it really for, for the rest of the world? I mean, you know, is it is it realistic to think that other countries can uh, emulate this? That's an excellent question. Uh, in um, I mean, Xi Jinping talked about this in his address, and uh, also later uh, in early December, there was a, a conclave of political parties in Beijing, and uh, hosted by uh, Xi Jinping and uh, Wang Huning, number five on the standing committee. And Xi Jinping specifically talked about that China will not impose its model on the world. So, you know, it's more of an issue of soft power. So it can be a model if the world wants to learn, but it will not be imposed from above. So, you know, if you ask Xi Jinping how he sees China in 2049, you know, the answer in the, uh, in the opening remarks, in the opening speeches, you know, China strong, China democratic. Uh, China uh, protects the rule of law, uh, you know, protection of the environment, uh, citizens' rights, etc., etc. Uh, but I think, and this is very important in the context of uh, you know, what does it mean to uh, include Xi Jinping's thought in the party constitution, I think we have to uh, drill a little bit deeper into this. First of all, the Communist Party, being communist naturally, the, sort of the, its basic tenets are Marxism. Now, Obviously, Marxism in China is very different from you know, Marxism in the former Soviet Union or uh, anywhere else, obviously. And this is why you know, Deng Xiaoping came with the slogan of uh, socialism with Chinese characteristics. Um, I think uh, we, first of all, so in addition to Marxism, there's uh, Mao Zedong thought as part of the uh, uh, constitution. And then there's Deng Xiaoping theory. So Xi Jinping is the first leader since Deng to have his sort of theoretical contribution written, written into the party charter. And I think this is very important. This is also explains why in this sort of Chinese equivalent of midterm elections, why there was no heir apparent. There's no apparent heir to take over uh, Xi Jinping because he really uh, set the agenda for the next uh, 30 years 
and you know, having his thought of you know, the great rejuvenation of the Chinese nation, this is what he has been talking about for the past five years, into the uh, party charter means his agenda of, you know, on the one hand, you know, uh, lifting uh, so and so many people from extreme poverty, you know, taking care of pollution, taking care of you know, gaps in society on the one hand, and on the other hand, China being on a you know, bigger player on a global stage, uh, uh, this is what it means. It means China will now be guided through 2049 by his uh, a set of ideals. What does it mean, the China model? Now, obviously, we don't know that yet because we don't, we're not uh, in 2049. But I'd like to highlight one uh, point, which is, uh, you know, will help to explain. I think to a certain extent, China itself is looking for its way. I think it's not com completely clear to the Chinese, you know. Of course, China wants to be you know, dem democratic and strong and, you know, uh, have rule of law and, it's, you know, it's working towards these goals. You know, Xi Jinping was speaking, standing there on the stage, giving a speech. Behind him, a red flag with a hammer and sickle. You know, anyone who visited China, you know, I I've never seen Bentleys in Israel. I only see them in Beijing. Okay, is, it a, is it a really a Marxist society? Is it a communist society? Not necessarily. You know? That's why Chinese the socialism, uh, socialism with Chinese characteristics means China you know, has the right to sort of find its way, you know, formulate its own uh, path. And I think this is one of the greatest challenges for the party. Okay, 89 million members, huge party. Still, it's less than 10% of the population. And if you, see, if you look at the development of the Communist Party, you see it sort of started as a, uh, you know, uh, 53 members in the first Congress of the party, you know, uh, uh, through uh, being sort of a guerrilla organization, you know, running away from uh, Chiang Kai-shek soldiers. Now China has to be a party for the entire nation. Because it's a different system. There's no just one ruling party. So it has to be a party for the entire nation. And this is why the party has to reinvent itself as well. Okay, this is why they're looking for a, a, a new model. You know, the, the Communist Party will probably not change its name and will continue to rule. But what does it mean to the average uh, man on the street? You know, uh, I think about 10 or 12 years ago, a, a people started holding ceremonies uh, sort of for Confucius, official, <coughs> official ceremonies. Now, you know, Marxist society is officially atheistic. What, what's the story with Confucius? So I think chi China is trying to find a way to sort of to create an amalgamation between Marxism, which is by definition is a foreign import, with traditional Chinese culture. And I, th I think the jury is still out there. Hmm. That's very interesting. Um, one of the things we haven't uh, touched on so much yet is the One Belt, One Road initiative. Uh, this giant kind of uh, infrastructure project uh, throughout uh, Central Asia and you know in the Middle East um, to uh, establish kind of trade, uh, trade and, and, and infrastructure links with China. It's also a way to kind of solidify, uh, you know, to, to tie the countries in this project into uh, China's economic uh, and political orbit. Rui, I was wondering if you could perhaps fill us in a bit more on what the One Belt, One Road Initiative uh, envisions and what role do you see for Israel in that project? Um, you know, I'll start with uh, an article that appeared, I think, just a couple of hours ago in The Marker um, about the uh, tender that came out on um, one of the electrification uh, tenders that, uh, that is being competed for uh, for the Israeli um, light rail <coughs> here in Tel Aviv. Um, and it seems like all the European companies that were part of the tender have pulled out. And the only companies remaining are Chinese companies and, uh, and Indian companies. Um, if, if you look at the, try to connect the dots between Congress, um, you know, what uh, Shen and, and Alex are saying about party ideology, um, I think the Belt and Road Initiative is a continuation of that. It's how do you take the ideology of the party um, and implant it into state-owned enterprises, which needs to be strengthened. I think we need to figure out a way um, how to take them and their challenges and make sure that they are successful around the world, not just in China, because China, in certain respects, has reached some kind of uh, level of, um, you know, uh, 
uh, quench, they've, uh, the, 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 they've been able to develop a lot of project and fixed assets which, which they needed to, and now they need to figure out how to take that capacity and put it internationally. Um, and so part of the vision is not necessarily a geopolitical vision, but how do you solve Chinese challenges by taking this massive infrastructure uh, um, uh, project. Uh, the second is uh, definitely economic. Um, uh, how do you create uh, an economic dependency of the, s the countries around China on, on Chinese money, on Chinese um, investment, on Chinese finances uh, as a way to in inject uh, in a soft power or sharp power or in any one, you know, way you want to define it into, um, into markets where China wants to have more and more influence. Um, it's a way to get a lot of the provinces in the east, in the in the west, out of poverty. Um, it's a way to establish uh, a very clear um, you know, position vis-a-vis -vis India, vis-a-vis -vis Japan, um, in areas of, uh, of, 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 of trading in in, uh, in, the, in the seas um, uh, from China all the way to Europe. Um, and then yes, it's uh, uh, there 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 is that uh, geopolitical uh, influence. Uh, that, that China wants um, as it starts to reach out into uh, um, into Europe and into um, um, into, the, into this part of the world as well. Uh, with regards to Israel, I think that, and I'm going to sort of steer away from Belt and Road Initiative to some of the general issues I think that Israel is facing with understanding and working with China. Um, I think the Belt and Road Initiative um, should highlight to the Israeli policymakers and to the um, Israeli business uh, community that there's more to be done with China outside of innovation. There is innovation, there is tech, and I think in the, in the, in the Congress there are certainly areas where China said, we have a challenge, we need to solve it, and Israeli companies and industry should say, hey, um, we should pay attention because there's opportunities, because China's facing issues and it's opening up in certain areas for us to be involved in. Beautiful China, environmental challenges is certainly one of them. Um, healthcare and China, uh, Healthy China 2030 is a program, is another area where companies that are looking to enter China should pay attention to. Um, uh, education system uh, and Xi Jinping's effort to try to provide top class education for rural areas as well as to the um, more wealthy uh, provinces is something that could be an opportunity. Um, and Israeli companies, especially in tech, should think, ah, there's an opportunity for us in those industries, let's, let's figure out how to go into China. But then there's the entire change happening um, in the Israeli economy. Uh, whether it's you know, new ports in Haifa and in Ashdod, whether it's the gas fines in the Mediterranean, uh, whether it's the uh, land bridges into Jordan, into the free trade zone in Jordan, uh, whether it's um, the movement of the entire military to the south and infrastructure development projects which are going to be taking place in the Negev. Uh, there are a lot of realities in the economy in Israel, you know, the trains and the transportation hubs, um, and, and Israel's relations with its region, whether it's with Cyprus and Greece on energy and uh, electric grid uh, connectivity, or with uh, potentially Jordan, uh, Egypt, uh, and then you know Saudi Arabia in, in a few years. And, and Israel should be considering, okay, how do we take this ideology, this new wave of Chinese focus, look at what we're doing here, and, and figure out what the points of connectivity are. It's not just about tech, and it's not just about innovation, even though the conversation right now is only about those things. Um, and so I think the future of, of the relationship, the future is not necessarily about Belt and Road Initiative only, uh, but about what can Israel learn from what's happening in China, take what it has, what it's developing anyway, and connect the dots because China has got a lot of interest in this part of the world, and if we don't have any kind of strict or clear policy on how to connect the things that we could um, fit into that, that interest, we'll probably be losing out on a major opportunity. Okay. Um, before we open it up to the audience, um, I just want to ask one last question. Um, you, know, you know, any of you uh, uh, three can, can feel free to, to jump in and answer. Um, <coughs> one of the things that Prime Minister Netanyahu talks about all the time is uh, using Israel's uh, increasing uh, economic contacts with Asia and with the developing world for political gain as well, that, uh, you know, perhaps these countries as they come to depend more economically on Israel, will support it at the UN and other, and other forums. But uh, we just saw uh, last week at the UN, uh, China voting against Israel on the Jerusalem Resolution at the GA and at the Security Council as well. Um, how, how realistic is it to think that increasingly you know, close ties between China and Israel could have some kind of a political dividend for Israel where it matters most, at the UN and in other international forums? 
any, you know, any of you can feel free to weigh in. And I can jump into that if, and then let you guys. Feel. I mean, I think um, it's clear to Israeli policymakers that that's not going to happen. As long as uh, the, the trade balance that China has with uh, the Arab world is so much larger and bigger than it is with Israel, that's probably not going to change. I think one of the things that Israel um, could be doing a much better job at, again, is, is to figure out how, to you, how do you explain the strategic relevance of Israel to China beyond tech. Because right now, if you've gone from a period of uh, no relationships until 1992, and then 1992 to, to, to until 2011, uh, trade that has gone up to 11, 12 billion dollars of, of trade between Israel and China and stagnated pretty much at that place, now we're at the technology supermarket phase, you know, Chinese companies coming here trying to figure out, okay, how do we find interesting technologies which would be relevant back into the, uh, you know, China as the leading technology and uh, science hub uh, by 2049. Um, Israel needs to paint a much broader picture of why is it so much more relevant than just those tactical needs of China for its own purposes are. And until we do that, we're not going to see a change. Not with China, not with anyone else, to be honest, um, on, on, the, on the issue of, of, of political uh, dividends. Um, you are seeing more of an opening. I mean, uh, you know, the fact that there are so many Chinese companies opening up R&D hubs, accelerators, investing in VCs, uh, delegations which are coming in, growth and tourism, there's much more of an openness to Israel than it was before. Israel is a security challenge, you know, um, maybe it still is, as is Brussels, as is Paris, as is Rome. Um, and maybe it's okay to come here and visit uh, where it wasn't in the past. Uh, if you look at uh, the fact that you know, delegations that were canceled last week because of Jerusalem, that will still happen, but it's probably short-lived and it will pick up in, in, in a few weeks. Um, was that a political statement, or, or was it just fear of I, th I think it's a lack of understanding. I mean, I, I honestly think that we're doing a better job <coughs> than we have been about explaining Israel to Chinese policy. <coughs> we should be doing a much, much better job in, in, in explaining what is the potential of Israel to become a strategic partner to China and things beyond tech. Um, and, and the relevance has, has not been made very clear yet. Bill, I'll, I'll add to that. Uh, Ray is absolutely right. I want to give some perspective, okay? The, the ship of Chinese foreign policy is moving slowly. Okay? Picture uh, an aircraft carrier. If you look at China in the 70s, okay, uh, lashing out in Israel and the West in general, calling Israel you know, the running dog of American imperialism, look at China today. Okay? A huge difference. So uh, China is not voting with Israel yet. And I, I agree with Ray that we have to uh, do a better job explaining our uh, relevance. And, by the way, I think the Chinese are uh, beginning uh, to understand. Uh, you know, Xi Jinping made his maiden visit to the Middle East in January 2016. He visited Saudi Arabia, he visited Iran, and he visited Egypt as the uh, headquarters of the Arab League. Uh, he did not visit Israel, not yet. Uh, but in it, there's a statement. Okay? Uh, as we all know, uh, Saudi Arabia and Iran are not exactly best of friends, and you know, Xi Jinping made clear by his visit that he wants to work with both. And this is, this is the opportunity here for Israel as part of a one Belt one road uh, to join a club uh, that maybe individual members are not willing to accept this as a member. I'll give you an example from the Belt and one Belt one road. Part of the initiative is the establishment of the Asia Infrastructure Investment Bank. Now, the deadline to apply for a IIB as a founding member, you can join the <coughs> As a founding member, you have to submit your application by March 31st, 2015. And in the run-up to uh, this deadline, uh, Xinhua News Agency uh, would publish sort of uh, you know, weekly updates of what other countries are on board, because you know, there was a tug of war between the US and China, you know, what countries would join. Japan did not join. Uh, UK, Israel, Australia did join. And you know, the last day, uh, I think Israel submitted literally its application literally by the bell, March 31st, as everything else in Israel. And then the Xinhua, uh, you know, article said, well, you know, if these and these countries and Israel joined the AIIB's founding <coughs> members. There was also Iran. Now, what we'll learn later, that Iran joined before Israel, but Xinhua did not write about this. Okay. So you know, this is a sort of a token to uh, Israel's uh, sensitivity. I think uh, China understands that you know, the Middle East is a challenging place. Uh, 
And I think if we can, you know, uh, raise sort of uh, go to the next level in terms of trade and in terms of relations, you know, from 10, 11 billion uh, trade with Iran is over 40 billion. I think we have to have some perspective. I think it will take some time, but the direction is correct. Well, Sean, I'm actually uh, curious to hear your. your well, uh, yes, I, I, I really uh, appreciate um, that these ideas are insights. And one thing I want to uh, say is that uh, actually, when it comes to Chinese, the um, you know Middle East politics, actually China, China walks a very delicate line when it comes to is the Middle East politics, and uh, left the uh, clear separation between economic partner and political partner. And my sense is that uh, if you look at the uh, Chinese Made in China 2025, Chinese this year. 10 sectors in which Chinese uh, aim to be uh, world leaders in, you know, in these areas, including AI and the robotics, the uh, uh, new energy vehicles, and so on. And look at uh, the, uh, the, the source of acquisitions of the uh, technology and know-how. And I think the U.S. market actually is of limits to Chinese capital, to Chinese the, uh, uh, companies. And also, Japan is not a good option. I think the only one of the few uh, remain um, markets for Chinese the, uh, tech and high tech acquisitions is the uh, Europe, Europe and uh, Israel. But uh, I think look at today's continental Europe, we have seen actually increasing backlash against the Chinese the acquisition and mergers. And also, we know that uh, the, um, not just about the uh, EU level, but also the member state level. We have seen increasing, you know, the war against Chinese capital and Chinese acquisitions. So I think Israel now is really playing a significant role in, you know, uh, in acquisition of state-of-the-art technologies. And I think uh, Chinese will really step up its efforts to to uh, play favor with its uh, Israeli host and uh, really do a lot of innovative cooperation with the uh, existing uh, potential Israeli partners. And I think that when now today, if you really talk about the refer to Israel, in if you any ask any uh, people, any person on the streets, what's your impression about Israel? I think uh, quite a lot of time people will say, now we know Israel is one of the most innovative country in the world. You know, compared to you know with six, the Six Day War and the other Palestinian Israel conflict, but now the new image about Israel here in China is that the, the reinvented uh, image about one of the most powerhouse of innovation and creativity. And when we talk about the mass innovation campaign in China and also made in China 2025, I think now Israel really played a critical, important role in this in, in this respect. Well, that's very interesting. So the uh, effort to brand Israel as innovation nation uh, is succeeding, at least in, in China. Um, so let's open it up to the audience now. Uh, you guys have been sitting very patiently. Uh, yes, sir, in the back there. Thank you. Uh, I'm Chaim again, the head of the Diplomacy Studies Program at uh, IDC and at Celia. I have a couple of questions. Um, uh, one has to do with the giant elephant, the other giant elephant in the room. <laughs> Which is the United States? Um, I recently came back from about India. No, yeah, yeah, no, 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 no. The elephant uh, analogy. Okay. Um, I recently came back from a trip uh, to uh, Beijing. Went uh, together with uh, Dan Katarivas and uh, Ambassador Ron Prosor and Yakov Amidro. And um, the, the American uh, piece um, was always there. Whether we're talking economics or security or Middle East, the United States and Israel's uh, partnership and friendship with the United States was, was always, always, always there. Could you elaborate a little bit um, about that uh, di dimension? Um, you, you mentioned that we no longer hear in, in China this idea of Israel being the, the attack dog of American imperialism. But still, the, the assumption is, is that you know, Israel has the United States, Israel, uh, uh, Israel has the United States' back, therefore Israel doesn't need China to vote for it in the UN. Um, there's also a tremendous amount of Chinese frustration about Israel's refusal to sell certain technologies uh, to China, especially in, in the defense um, uh, field because of the friendship with the United States. How will Israel's strategic alliance with the United States play out uh, or restrict 
uh, the development um, of this relationship going forward. Uh, second question, very brief, demographics. China and aging society. Uh, how will that uh, uh, impact the realization of Qi's uh, vision? We haven't spoken about the moment. The question is to me about the, the US. The Anybody government. you would like to okay. Okay. pick that up? Um, I think China is uh, well aware that uh, Israel is uh, you know, cooperating with the US on uh, military technology and things like this. Um, you know, there were some crises in the past between Israel and China in this area. I think we have overcome them from the point of view of the Chinese as, as much as we could do. Um, I think China is also well aware, I mean, speaking of frustration, you know, Israel not selling, you know, certain technology to China, uh, you know, China is also well aware that we're, we are selling this technology to India. Uh, and I haven't seen uh, public pro protests on the street of Beijing against these kind of uh, uh, sales. And I think uh, uh, I'll revert to what Huang Shan said. I think that's a very important point. There's a sort of a decoupling okay, between you know, political, military issues and uh, economic issues. Uh, economically, since, especially since Netanyahu's visit uh, to China in 2013, uh, there's been a flood of uh, you know, both Chinese investments in Israel and you know, China and, 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 uh, and, uh, and Israel are, uh, one can say, you know, celebrating their uh, relationship in the open. And uh, I know that uh, you know, there are also some Arab countries who are not exactly uh, happy about this, you know, but China is uh, going along with it. And, you know, in the recent visit of Netanyahu in March, uh, the China-Israel relationship has been uh, upgraded uh, to you know, uh, innovative strategic partnership, which you know, sort of puts it in stone, if you will, uh, you know, Israel's uh, value uh, uh, to China. Uh, but it's true, you know, if you know, the China-U.S. relationship will deteriorate, I think it will also impact, uh, unfortunately, our ties with, um, uh, with, uh, with China. I think, you know, when Trump uh, got into the White House, uh, people expected the sky to fall. And I think, I think the sky did not fall. And Trump, Trump visited China, and the sky did not fall. Uh, I think uh, the Chinese know how to... Uh, manage this uh, relationship. Um, you know, before Trump visited uh, Beijing recently, um, uh, CCTV interviewed uh, General McMaster, the uh, National Security Advisor uh, of Trump, and, you know, there was a small hint of disapproval when the reporter asked McMaster uh, why the Chinese uh, do not detect a sort of a unified policy for China which is kind of rare for a, a Chinese reporter. Usually they're very, uh, very polite, very Chinese. It's kind of rare to detect this kind of criticism, but I think it means that China wants to engage with the US. So I'm not sure how. I think the, the door is open. So, you know, I don't know what will happen in the future, but I think, uh, I think both sides, if both sides behave, I think, uh, you know, this relationship will continue. Um, I'll, I'll add a few things to, to that point. I think it's an important question. Um, first is some, something we did, we did not mention about the Congress is that one of the top things on the agenda was the investment in the growth and the reform of the PLA, the uh, People's Liberation Army. Um, and that is certainly something top of the agenda of the Communist Party. Um, and the investment behind it is going to be significant. We should remember that the Chinese military is uh, certainly not as um, big and doesn't get as much investment as the, as the U.S. military, but it's the second largest in the world. So it's around $270 billion a year um, or, or something in that, in that scope. Um, and certainly Israel cannot play and will not play a part of, of supporting um, the, the interests of, uh, of the defense establishment in, in China. Uh, I think we have a small window of opportunity because uh, I actually may, may disagree with, with Alex. We are... Uh, I mean, the interesting thing about the Israeli economy is that it's not competitive to the Chinese economy, whereas the U.S. economy is. And most of the companies in, in the U.S. with a presence in China are increasingly frustrated uh, with the lack of fair trade, 
uh, with um, issues of uh, changing regulation, um, and so on and so forth. Um, Israeli companies don't uh, don't have that because they're small. They're um, they go in, they want to sell a technology, give it away, and and, and go back and do the, the next thing. Uh, they're not impacted, and Israel is not impacted as an economy by Chinese investment into Israel. On the contrary, but you're seeing um, more and more policies, um, certainly in the U.S. with CFIUS, uh, the congressional. Uh, bodies and executive branches which are looking to see uh, what Chinese investment in any space, whether it's national security or in food or in solar energy, what does it mean for the U.S. economy? And you see more and more of that in Europe as well. You're going to be seeing that in Australia. You're going to be seeing that in other markets which are very much concerned about um, Chinese investment in those markets, sometimes for good reasons, sometimes for bad reasons, sometimes for protectionist reasons. But the more Western markets and Western economies are concerned with Chinese investment, the more pressure economically will be put on Israel in terms of what is it doing, um, sort of not going in line with other Western markets. I think you will be seeing that. Dani, I know you're going to have some good questions. Uh, just to, I mean, Dani Katareva from the Red Defense Association, I work with the behind China and all China, whatever you call it. I mean, obviously we are looking at the Middle East, okay, because we live in the Middle East, and it seems that we don't hear enough about Chinese involvement in the Middle East. Can you maybe elaborate a bit more about that? Not talking about Iran, which is a bit on the outskirts, but I'm talking about that there is a lot of presence in Egypt, there is, might be presence in, what about Syria, for instance, the reconstruction of Syria? I mean, it seems that China has understood that it has its stability in the region for its road and belt initiative. So the question is, how we, Israelis, can leverage on that? Is there a possibility? This decoupling between economics, politics, security, whatever, I mean, it might be, maybe that's the policy, but we just heard this morning about this delegation that came back from China, where the Chinese tried to, to bring together Palestinians and Israelis, not in a very successful manner, by the way, uh, but uh, they even, even didn't meet there, I mean, it was quite strange to hear the report. Maybe the report is not right because we're all dealing with fake news, and I'm waiting to hear the people themselves what they, how it happened over there. But there seems to be unclarity about the role that China can play, should play, uh, will play in that region, and we should, as Israelis, try to see how we uh, take advantage of that. Maybe you can comment. On that. Who would like to? Okay. Uh, well, uh, maybe I can chip in some words. I think. Uh, when it comes to Chinese Middle East you know, policies, I think China is willing to play a balanced and a commensurate role to his power and uh, authority, you know, uh, uh, capacity in the Middle East. We really are set up for a limited role um, for, for in the Middle East. For example, I just heard over the states Beijing plays host to a symposium between Palestinian side and the Israeli side. And it's really, I think, encouraged side during the standoff surrounding the state of Jerusalem as the uh, Israel capital. And I think China is really playing a more quiet and role in a diplomatic front. And we don't want to overplay our, our role in, you know, in the midst because we know it's a really geopolitically sensitive area and it's like a, power, a powder can. And we don't want to wait too much, too deep into this area. And we'll play a limited and commensurate role. And, and for example, I think in here in China, I think it's a politically correct way to say that we sided with the uh, Palestinian cause. You know, I think this is a decade long policies here in Beijing. I don't think any single, even like a Tom, Trump and like President Xi will really change this official line, official policy about the uh, siding, siding with the Palestinian in is the uh, you know a, a state uh, building a cause. But uh, uh, in some other ways, I think China really uh, try to uh, play a more balanced role. And because, for example, we talk about Saudi Arabia, I think in the next year one of the biggest landmark uh, uh, capital market events is the the, the possible uh, listing of the uh, Aramco. And now we know that the uh, US stock market and also Hong Kong stock market really are vying for the, uh, the uh, listing of the MRENCO. I think at this moment, Chinese don't want really to irritate you know, our Arab you know, friends or allies, you can you name it. We just want to place the limited role and, uh, and uh, uh, quite a lot of behind the scenes. 
Uh, sir, in the blue shirt, yes. Yeah, I, I think uh, maybe there's uh, my, uh, too much focus on the big issues, but the smaller issues might be important like for what? China. Like, China has a desire to bring prosperity to all their people. I've only been in Israel for five years, so I don't understand many things about the country. But one of the problems in Israel is the perception of many Israelis that the prosperity of some is not moving through the society in a healthy way. So if we could, for instance, show China as a society that we are able to bring prosperity to more and more of our people through projects that are not maybe as glamorous as high tech, through education programs, through other initiatives, medical initiatives, where the Chinese see that we are innovative, that that is more important than worrying about the political issues, which are, in a way, you know, I don't want to say a joke, but it's a joke. You know, you can't do much about these PR stuff. But Israel can develop in a way that China says, well, there's a piece of a model that we can incorporate. And maybe they can incorporate a piece of our model in the common effort to get prosperity. Well, what do you guys think? Is there something relevant that Israel can teach China about uh, you know, income inequality? And, uh... I don't think Israel can teach anybody anything about income inequality. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, but I will answer about the political element, because I think that's a very important point to make. Um, in China, um, it's, political, it's politics first, business later. And I think that the Congress actually made it very clear that if you want to get into uh, doing business in China, you need to understand that in every business, in every interaction, uh, you need to think about what is the political motivation for a deal before you think about what's the business motivation for the deal. I think that's probably more important. So just, if that helps out in terms of thinking about China today, and certainly after this Congress, I think it's, uh, it's very relevant. Uh, yes, sir. Thank you very much, first of all. Um, just one question. Uh, at the Congress, we have seen uh, Jiang Zemin sitting there, although sleeping. Uh, but uh, it was, to the best of my knowledge, understanding that with the previous President Hu Jintao, there was some kind of tension between the more, more conservative camp and more progressive camp, let's call it this way. Um, how does this still exist now with the new president that intends maybe to stay there for some more years? And if it does exist, some tension, is it, how will it work or how will it be solved in the future? Thanks. Tom, what do you think about this? Is there still a tension between uh, uh, progressives and conservatives in the party? Well, uh, I think your question actually um, has to do with the uh, intra-party factional strife. And I think definitely you have a liberal camps, you have conservative camps, and uh, when it comes to but one thing, I think, just suppose this scenario in which President Xi talked to his the, uh, the party colleagues that now we are at uh, on the cusp of the, uh, the great rejuvenation of the trans nation, or we can say further that uh, the great rejuvenation of the Communist Party. I would prefer the latter expression, you know, the, the CCP's rejuvenation. And he said, if you don't jump on board, and uh, uh, with, I think if you really do a lot of damage behind the closed door, you really rock the boat. The boat really, uh, you know, it, it, it's, it's not my, not my own boat. It uh, really has to do with the, uh, the welfare of 80, 80, 89 billion um, party members and uh, 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 the nation. So I think his message is quite clear that uh, uh, we are at a really close roads for the, uh, the party and the nation. If you don't join us, please stay away and don't damage, don't scupper the, the, the boat. And uh, furthermore, uh, I will not uh, surprise to see you know internal strife going on in the years to come. But the key issue is that uh, at the uh, at our panel. That now, presidency is the all powerful, the most powerful politician since the president, uh, the, the Mr. Deng, even a chairman Mao. And he can really um, wield his you know, influence without very little resistance from other factions, from other interest groups within the party. But 
the preconditions that he cannot mess things up. So if his economic and financial and societal agenda can really move ahead without many much resistance, I think, and that he can really achieve his political and economic goal in the years to come, I think it's really very really silence the uh, criticism within the party and the really uh, you know. And, and one thing is quite important because he thought he thought has been enshrined in the party constitution. That means if you want to upend the status quo, you really want to challenge its authority. You really uh, you know um, risks you know, upending the whole the the consensus you know formed within the party congress. I think it's not just about himself. It's not about President himself, but about the party, about consensus concept. So I don't think anybody or any single person has the authority and the power and the mandate to really upend the current, you know, power structure. Well, you know, one I of think, the uh, yeah, in the years huh, I think the political safe. One of the things that I've uh, been wondering about, actually, uh, there was always this this uh, belief that. Um, when communist societies began to open up economically, that it would necessarily uh, entail a political opening, that there would be uh, a groundswell of, of demand from the people for greater freedom of speech and, and, and greater uh, freedoms. Um, to what extent do you think China can succeed in advancing its reforms, uh, becoming this uh, prosperous society and a world leader while still tightly controlling uh, free speech and the people's ability to say what they want and do what they want? I'll, I'll pose that to any of you. Uh, I mean, in, in some respects, I think that's been the challenge of uh, the party from its establishment. Uh, and what, uh, what is it called, mandate under heaven, you know, what, what actually happens, you know, the, the, the success of the leading um, authority and, and whichever point in Chinese history would um, would mean its uh, its success or failure as as a leadership uh, um, as, a, as an authority. Um, I think that if Xi Jinping is successful with some of his programs, some some of his efforts, uh, I don't think you're going to see more opening. I think we'll be seeing um, a, uh, a you know a, a, a more uh, a, a larger group of, uh, of of Chinese who are behind. Um, uh, the leadership, uh, which we're seeing, you know, declines in pollution, which is seeing better medical health, um, which is seeing a rise in education uh, for their children. So I think, in many respects, it really depends on, on the outcomes, and the party is trying to make sure that whatever it does, it does uh, does things which are ultimately uh, fulfilling the needs of, of the people. Otherwise, they risk their own um, um, ability to uh, to govern. Uh, and so I, I, I would probably say no. You're going you're to be seeing and the same kind of political leadership and the same kind of ideological leadership as long as they're successful in, in, in meeting their, their goals. Uh, I would like to add just one more thing. I agree with Ray. I think uh, the party, you know, it's not a Western political model, but I think the party is extremely sensitive to public opinion. Uh, you know, otherwise Xi Jinping uh, would not talk about pollution and poverty uh, alleviation and, you know, distribution, uh, better distribution of wealth if he uh, wasn't concerned uh, about, you know, public opinion. So, you know, the party decided, for its own reasons, which were not probably private to, uh, you know, to emphasize the role of Xi Jinping within this political constellation. And this is what, you know, the media has been doing for the past five years. You know, if uh, uh, previously we could talk about what you mentioned, you know, uh, factionalism, political strife. It's a big party, of course, there's eternal debate, okay, you know, but when Xi Jinping goes on stage, not only Jiang Zemin was there and he wasn't always sleeping, uh, Zhu Rongji was also there and all the past leaders all lining up behind Xi Jinping and, you know, writing his thought into the constitution means he is, you know, he has his model, he has his, the party united behind, uh, uh, you know, his model. Uh, in terms of, uh, you know, political control of society, I think uh, this is a, for the party itself, it's also a trial and error, trial and error process. Okay. We've got time for one more question uh, from the audience here. Uh, let's see. Yes, ma'am. Hi, I'm the Chinese editor from Israel newspaper, Pop Times of Israel, and my question
question is open for everyone. And based on what Mr. Huang mentioned, there is a symposium between the Israel and Palestinian delegations about the conflict, like the Jerusalem, etc. So what do you think the, the Chinese government the Chinese government want to play, like the role they want to play in this um, in this conflict? And why the timing is like this? Why they have... Um, there are some opinions that the Chinese criticism towards Israel, based um, toward regarding to the Palestinian conflict is less less harsher than before. So do you think it's true? And like what is the future potential of such a Sure. Uh, I did not attend this uh, Israeli Palestinian seminar in Beijing, so I don't know what was said there. Uh, but uh, <laughs> Xi Jinping was talking about this seminar for at least half a year. It has nothing to do with Trump. I, I don't think they planned this uh, around uh, Trump's decision. I'm not sure uh, they knew about this decision in advance. I'm not sure Trump knew about this decision in advance. <laughs> um, but, you know, even already in the first visit of Netanyahu to China in 2013, uh, Xi Jinping put his, you know, four-point proposal for, you know, peace between Israel and the Palestine. So, you know, in this sense, Chinese position is, is not really new. But I, I saw a very interesting quote from uh, one of the better informed, smarter uh, Middle East analysts in China, Yin Gang. There's a story in uh, China Daily a couple of days ago talking about the seminar. And, you know, Yin Gang said, this kind of seminar, and I'm quoting, is within China's capabilities. Okay, I think this, this already tells the whole story, okay, if it was quoted right. You know, China is not the U.S. It does not play the role of the U.S. in the Middle East. You know, all it can do is try to bring um, you know, people together to see how can it be solved. I think from the level of the delegation on both sides, uh, you can see that uh, um, you know, we're, we're still some, there's still more work to be done before you know, peace in the Middle East can be achieved. Okay. Uh, well, listen, folks, that's all uh, the time that we have. It's a very interesting discussion. Um, I thank our, our panelists uh, for joining us and uh, for um, uh, putting up with a, uh, a Skype link for, for such a long period. Uh, and thank, thanks to the audience for coming and to uh, Rebecca and the Israel Asia Center for putting this on.